Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa So good morning and happy new year to everyone. Uh, wish you all a very successful new year full of Dhamma and may you be able to attain all your aspirations during this year. So uh, I think we took a break for two weeks and uh, I think maybe most of us have uh, forgotten that what we have uh, discussed so far. So now so far we uh, have discussed about the Rupa, the chapter is uh, titled as Rupa. We knew about the certain classifications like uh, how many rupas according to the Theravada tradition and what are the clusters of rupas which we call the rupa kalapas and also the generations of these clusters we call the rupa santati and future we may learn about the rupa sarira the bodies of rupa and also the santana the systems of rupa as well then uh, having discussed uh, about the rupa briefly we went in to explain the cluster of a rupa which we call a rupa kalapa rupa kalapa and uh, last week last two lessons were the previous two lessons were dedicated to explain how the rupas exist within a kalapa if you remember we also mentioned what are the contributions of of the four great elements to a kalapa and what are the contributions of the derived matter to a kalapa you mentioned that uh, the patavi gives the substantial nature to the kalapa uh, we can also call it territorial. It, is, it acts as an essence. It, it prevents another substance coming into its space. And, all, and then Apo acts as the uh, bonding nature which holds this hardness into a certain area of the space. And uh, Vayu, a bloating force, bloating nature, extends this. So with the, with the combination of Apo and Vayu, uh, the Patavi, the hardness, happen to exist in a certain area certain range of the in certain range of the uh, certain area of the space uh, then uh, tejo it uh, strengthens the kalapa the remaining uh, elements of the of the of the of the cluster color smell taste has no whatever whatsoever contribution to the kalapa but the nutriment does strengthen the kalapa in a certain sense while they are in an animate body while they are in animate bodies, like in living bodies. So these were the, play, uh, and also we, we explained once, there are three ways the Buddha has explained about the Rupa in terms of their abandoned nature, specifically mainly two, two ways, as things and natures and mere qualities. Uh, in terms of explaining Rupa as things, he has taken two approaches in terms of the abandoned quality and in terms of a unique quality that exists within the thing, material thing. And when it comes to, the, so the examples were, Haya is taken as Patavi because it, it is abundant with hardness. Uh, saliva and blood is taken as Apo because the cohesion, uh, the flowing nature is well found in this in these, uh, material stuff. Uh, then uh, the Chakku, the eye is considered as another Rupa, the entire eye because it contains the sensitivity to the Rupa. So that was based on the unique, unique qualities that exist within things. Finally, uh, as quality, as mere qualities, the, the discourses about the Ayatana and Datu were delivered uh, based uh, taking Rupa as mere qualities, not as things. So these were the topics that we have discussed so far. I think I, I was able to distribute the handout number four yesterday evening. Hope you were able to get it printed it out or uh, in, your, in your phones, uh, whatever device. Yeah, so today, I think if, if I also would like to remind that once in the, in the previous two lectures I mentioned, there are two ways that we can, we can make an approach to a reality. There are two ways that we can make an approach to understand the reality. But the first is being Savakas, having learned what the realities are from the doctrine, we study about these realities and then we start to understand the uh, actual world based on these realities. The second, sorry, the second approach is one observes the nature and then 
investigates this and comes into the reality. So there are two approaches. It, one is from inside to out, one approach. Then the next approach is from outside to inside. So if these were the realities, reality of the world, which is quietly, mostly hidden, because the reason is, the reality is, why we say reality is something hidden? If it is very obvious, people would not have diverse ideas about the truth. Why people are having various views about this existence? Because the reality is something difficult to understand. It is something always covered. Covered not in the sense of covered by a material thing. It is something profound. Otherwise, people would easily, surely, everyone, if something, if, if reality is something like this form that everyone can see, everyone would understand the same truth about the world. There would, would not be much debates about the actual existence, actuality about the existence. So then the, the observable world, world we can observe, So this is the world we can observe. So we start from so the, always the, tea, the the master, the founder of a religion would start from here. He observes the world and he comes to, to understand the reality. Normally what the disciples do, they study the reality first and then try to figure out how the world is made out of these realities. These are the two main approaches. So when we are studying Abhidhamma, most of the times what we do is we take the second approach. We take the second approach. We study the uh, reality like Chitta, Chetsikas, Rupas and then we start, start to figure out how the world is made out of them. But a teacher, the Buddha had only one way because no one had uh, discovered the realities before him. So he had to observe the world. Through the world, he understood the hidden or the reality beneath the observ observable universe. So then, now regarding the Rupa Kalapa. Rupa Kalapa is made out of Rupa. So we see a Kalapa. What we normally do is we study the Rupa, the four great elements and the derived matter and then we try to understand how the Kalapa is made by these rupas. That's what we did actually in the previous two lectures. We study the natures of the rupa and how they are contributing to the kalapa. What we are going to do today is we think about the kalapa. We are coming from this approach. We take the kalapa and try to understand how the rupa exists within them. How can we understand the rupas looking into a kalapa? I also mentioned last week, few week, uh, last, in the last lectures, Kalapa is not a panyati, it's not a concept. It's a combination of realities. But when you take as a one thing as a kalapa, when you take it as a one thing, which we call the kalapa, it is an idea that is synthesized or made in our mind. So kalapa, in the actual sense, kalapa is a combination of realities. But when we take it with our minds as a one thing, then we consider it as a concept. So now we, our approach would be, so this is the first approach, the second approach actually, right, coming from inside to outside. So we have already done this, today we are going to discuss about this approach from the Kalaputta, Kalapa to the Rupa. Before going into this, this approach, I would like to take a simile, a simile taken from particle physics and try to understand and, and with that approach we'll be able to look we will be able to make that same approach into the kalapas. So I will be taking the electron. I think most of you are familiar this word with this word electrons. Electron is one of the subatomic particles according to the parti uh, according to particle physics which is a fundamental thing out of which the entire universe is made. We have a few subatomic particles, if I just briefly explain. The quarks, out of which the protons and neutrons are made of. Then we have the leptons. Uh, the two groups of leptons are 
one is neutrinos, the others are electron, mu, uh, tau, and muon, muon and tau. So altogether, there are six quarks and six leptons, 12 particles. Then we have another four bosons, which we call the force carrying particles, Z boson, uh, I think if I remember the W boson, uh, then the photon, uh, and there's another uh, gluon, yeah. These are the force carrying particles and they have hypothesized, hypothesized the uh, existence of a Higgs boson, another special particle, and there's a Higgs field which gives the mass to all these particles. That is how the particle physics explains. According to it, there is nothing called a consciousness. Consciousness is a product or is the functioning of these particles in the brain. So this is a different, different stream of knowledge. There are lots of arguments about this, a lot of controversies about this. Particle physics cannot explain the consciousness exactly. It has been an accepted norm that the particle physics is unable to explain the qualia, the conscious, the, the, the conscious nature of a person. But still they are making efforts to explain it. So anyway, so my approach is to explain that electron. So electron is a substance. Normally it has a certain diameter. It has a mass, so we can call it also has a weight, if, if it can be measured. Uh, so this electron is a substance. Substance means, last week we explained what is a substance, is the essence of a material thing. In Sinhalese we call it the sare, the essence, what the material is made out of. This is a substance. And they are extended things. Extended means they have occupied a certain volume in the space. So it means three dimensional things, which has the height, length and width, the three dimensions. So in the actual world, there are no two dimension, dimensional objects. Even we draw a line, there are certain, it, it's made out of particles. So particle always has a certain width. So there are no two dimensions in the world. What exists is a three dimension. So some brings the fourth dimension of time after the Albert Einstein's uh, findings. Anyway, so what we know in the physical world is a three dimensional thing. So electron is an extended substance. Substance means it's made out of some essence and it is extended. It, it has been spread over, over a certain area of space. So if you think about this phone, it has occupied a certain volume. It, this is not a two, 2D thing. This is a 3D uh, object. So it has taken some volume in the space. Now, they are, the empty space was here. So when this has come into this position, it has occupied that previous space, which was empty. So therefore, we would say uh, elect electron as a particle is an extended thing which is a sub extended substance. These are the word I would use. Extended substance. So the same approach I'm going to make for the Rupa Kalapa. Why I make this approach in electrons? Because then we'll understand how to understand a Kalapa. Now, how do we understand the material stuffs from the side of a Kalapa, coming through a Kalapa? Then we have some other attributes of the electron. It has a mass. So normally we say, the, uh, the physics, physics say that the mass of an electron is due to its interaction with the Higgs field, right? Anyway, now it also has something called inertia mass. Inertia mass. Inertia mass is the resistance, now how do we explain this? This is very important. How do we give these definitions? These are quite important to understand the color. Now, inertia mass means when we make an electron into an acceleration, not a velocity. Acceleration means, in single is we call the Thoranaire. It makes things to get faster. We increase the velocity. So, the speed, we increase the speed. So when an electron is put into an acceleration, it has a certain resistance. It doesn't allow us to easily accelerate it. It doesn't allow, the electron doesn't allow us to easily accelerate it. It has a certain resistance, it's quite difficult to accelerate. We have to put a certain extra force into it. 
So this resistance is the inertia mass. So this is how we make the definition. If there is no clear, clear cut explanation what the mass is. Mass has been explained based on a certain function. We cannot just pinpoint and say this is the mass of the electron. It's not the substantial quality because photon itself has a substantial quality but it doesn't have a mass. It can be accelerated to its maximum level that is speed of the light. So the inertia, the definition, the how do we make the definition is quite important. So this kind of approach I'm going to make to the Rupakalapa as well to in order to understand the four great elements. It will, it will be more vivid and more lucid after we do that. So now the resistance, now there we cannot show what is the inertia mass, inertia mass is the resistance. So there is a certain quality within the electron which doesn't exist in a photon, which doesn't, which doesn't allow us to accelerate as we like. So we have to increase the force. That is why electron, now we, we, there will, always there will be a limitation to which limit that we increase the velocity. So if we, if we want to make it into the light, speed of the light, as to my understanding, there should be an infinite amount of force has to be given. So the resistance of the electron for the, uh, to, for the acceleration is the inertia mass. Then it also has something called a spin. When an electron is taken with, from a, through a magnetic field, this is a magnetic field, MF, right? The magnetic field. This is attracted to various directions. The electron is attracted to various directions. That nature of the electron, due to which it gets attracted while traveling through a magnetic field, is called its spin. Then it also has a charge. How does how the physicists explain the charge? If this is the electron, if this is the proton, they are attracted to each other. You cannot show something called a charge in an electron. When it, it is taken closer to a proton, it gets attracted to it. That nature, which makes it to get attracted. And also, when an electron is brought towards another electron, it repels. It goes away. It repels. That quality within the electron is called the charge. Now, if you think these are the characteristics of an electron, there are, there are more other characteristics, but just I took some few characteristics. Now think about this again. If, there is, if it is not an extended substance, it can never be an electron. It has to have a mass. We just forget about this mass. We talk about the inertia mass. It is something, it, it always has a resistance for the acceleration. It, it gets attracted to various directions when it goes through a magnetic field. It gets attracted to a proton and it repels from another electron. So we call it has a charge. Now think, what is an electron according to this explanation? Is the mere extensional, extended substance is the electron? No. Without these qualities, you cannot call this the mere, mere substantial quality. Cannot, we cannot call it an electron. Because the proton also has certain kind of different these attributes. Because the charge is different of a photon. Inertia mass is different of a photon. But it's also a substantial thing. So the mere sub extended substance essence, substantial essence is not the electron. And these qualities themselves alone cannot represent the electron as well. The spin itself is not the electron. The charge itself is not the electron. What is an electron is a combination of all these. Without the extended substance, essence, substantial essence, there cannot be electron. Without a charge, specific charge, without a specific spin, without a specific inertia mass, you cannot call this an electron. So these are all attributes of the electron. When they are all together, we can call something an electron. So this is the approach that we make, the similar approach. Now we are going to make to the Rupa Kalapa. So now, shall we detail the characteristics of a Kalapa according to the Theravada tradition? There can be a lot of arguments about this. Anyway, we are within a discourse community, so we accept these as facts. As also to, we should be explained briefly. The discourse community means a group of people who communicate 
about a certain idea or ideology with a specific goal. So within a discourse community, things that should not be proven, proven, things are accepted as norms, accepted as true, are called the facts. So within a Buddhist discourse community, you don't need to, a rebirth is a fact. You don't need to prove it. But when you go into a scientific discourse community, rebirth is not a fact. It is an opinion only. It has to be something proven. It's not an uh, uh, accepted norm. So we are, in a, we are talking about, a, I'm, I'm, I'm explaining it within the Theravada, uh, the discourse community of Theravadians. So I take these information within the books as facts without trying to prove them, right? So now a Kalapa, what are the attributes of a Kalapa? It is an extended substance, right? So I put them into two categories. Instead of saying an extended substance, I would call it Rupa Kalapa has a substance. Is a substance, better to say, sorry. is a substance. It means it has a substantial essence. That's why we call, that's what I mean here, has a substantial essence. Then it is extended. It is extended in the space. It consumes a volume in the space. It has a color. It has a smell or order, whatever it is, right? Then it has a taste. It has a nutriment. It has nutriment, which allows to strengthen the living bodies and also produces new kalapas within living bodies. So these are the attributes of a kalapa. Now think about a kalapa. Kalapa is a conventionally we take it as a one thing. Conventionally, I'm talking because we are coming from the different, the second approach. We are coming. Actually, it's the first approach. We are coming from a kalapa. We find a kalapa during our synthesis uh, analysis, intellectual analysis. We were able to divide the things, stuff that we find, into particles, and those particles were able to. We were able to reduce into further particles, further smaller particles, and then we come into a substance which cannot be divided any further. About this also, there is an argument in the ancient Greeks thought. There is another point about the rupa, about the matter. Ancient Greeks, some of the Greeks thought that the substance, the matter can be divided infinitely. There is no limitation for this division. Because if you think about the subtlest point of a space, you cannot come to the actual point of a space because even you can keep on zooming that. For the ancient Greeks thought that the rupa can be divided infinitely. This idea was rejected by the modern scientists saying that there is a limitation, there is a physical limitation for division. We come into a certain particle that is that defies further analysis. Defies means it prevents, it doesn't allow it to be divided any further physically. So that kalapa, that is according to the particle physics, Quarks cannot be divided any further as far as the investigations have gone, gone so far. A neutron, a lepton cannot be divided. A force carrying particle cannot be divided any further. According to the Theravadis, the Rupa Kalapa cannot be divided physically any further. So now this Kalapa, now we are taking this Kalapa. In our intellectual analysis, we found a Kalapa which, is, which defies us any further division, physical division. Now we are trying to think about the attributes of the one. We are trying to think what is this Kalapa? What is it made out of? How do we understand this nature? Now think about the Kalapa. Now we know, now we are going to explain this. This Kalapa is an extended thing. It has a substantial quality because a Kalapa doesn't, another Kalapa doesn't allow another Kalapa to go through it. It has a substantial essence. It is extended, it's 3D. According to Theravada, it has a certain color. 
It has a certain smell. It has a certain taste. It has a certain nutriment. So this is how we explain a kalapa from outside. Now, out of these, I shall specifically focus on these two qualities. The substantial nature and the extended nature of the kalapa. Right? Before going into that, we have to mention the only substantial quality is not the kalapa. Without a color, you cannot call something a kalapa. According to Theravada. You, without a taste, you cannot something call a kal something a kalapa. Because a kalapa is a combination of things. If any of these parts are taken away, it's not a kalapa according to the Theravada tradition. So none of these qualities alone are the kalapa. Kalapa is a combination of all these qualities. Like none of these qualities, none of the uh, uh, individual qualities were called an electron. You cannot call it each and everything an electron. It's a combination. When all are together, we call an electron. So likewise, when all these qualities are together, we have to call something a kalapa. Now then, out of these qualities, the, ex the, the mere extended nature is not a kalapa. The mere substantial nature is not a kalapa. Mere color is not a kalapa. Mere smell, taste, nutriment is not a kalapa. Now we'll focus, shall focus on these two qualities of the kalapa. What are these? The substantial quality, extended quality. The substantial quality and extended quality. All right. Now, what is the, now if we think about these two qualities, just forget about the color, forget about the taste, forget about the smell, forget about the nutriment quality. Now think about it. Now it's a substance, a colorless, smellless, tasteless, tasteless non-nutritious substance. If you imagine. Right? So it's extended, it has occupied certain space, substantial, it prevents. It has an essence, it prevents the entering of another substance. That's a very basic quality of a substance. So what are the attributes that we can think about this? It consumes a volume. Consumes a volume. It is tangible. Felt as a surface. When we touch it, it's felt as a surface. Felt as a surface. And you're also capable of holding, bearing another kalapa upon it. Now, for example, Another kalapa can stand upon it. Capable of bearing or holding another kalapa, a substance upon it. Why is that? Because it doesn't allow, it doesn't allow the other kalapa to go through it. And what the final quality that the most important it doesn't allow it doesn't allow doesn't sorry doesn't allow another substance to enter enter its space I have given all this in the handout so these are the four qualities that we can see here it consumes a certain volume because it's a 3d thing it is tangible felt as a surface because why the hand is also made out of stuff it doesn't let the hand to go through it. So it's felt as a surface. Another thing can be kept on it. Why is all, why all these? Why, why all these two qualities are? Because it doesn't allow another substance to go through it. That's the most important. 
it consumes a certain volume. We shall focus on these two now. A certain volume. Out of all, now think about these three, the last three, even the last one, the last quality. Not allowing another substance to enter into space. This quality is a substantialation. What is this? This nature, like the resistance for acceleration, was called inertia mass. Resistant for acceleration in an electron is the iner it's, it's inertia mass. The quality of a rupa kalapa, which doesn't allow another kalapa to enter its space, is called patavi. Sorry, I think it's not clear. This quality is mainly because of Patavi. Patavi defies the entering entrance. So instead of saying hardness, you can call Patavi the nature within a Kalapa, which prevents another Kalapa entering into its space. So why did I bring, explain about the electron? So how do we make definitions? These are very scientific, like scientific approaches. It's, 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 it, we can make a definition like that. Because even in the electron, the charge or the mass spin has been explained based on its functions. The nature of electron getting attracted to various sides while traveling through a magnetic field is called its spin. The nature of an electron getting attracted to a proton and repelling, repelling from another electron is called its charge. The nature of an electron which, which prevents or which, which disturbs or which resists the acceleration is called inertia mass. So in terms of Rupa Kalapa, how do we explain this? The Patavi, the quality which defies us, which prevents the entering of another substance into it. So that is felt as a hardness, that is felt as a surface. That is the quality which enables the Rupa Kalapa to hold something upon it. The patitana rasa according to Pali. Patitana rasa means the function of the Pali. Function of Patavi is to become a base for the other, other qualities within the Kalapa. And at the same time, upon another, another Kalapa can be kept on it. So that's why we can keep something on it. Within the Kalapa, it acts as the base for the other remaining three to function. At the same time, it can act also act as another a surface to another Kalapa. So now, this is how we define Patavi. When we are coming into, now think about, now always, please don't forget where we were. We were explaining from Kalapa to, this is our approach today. Kalapa to Rupa, right? So we explain now, think about a kalapa. This kalapa is a thing and it doesn't allow another thing to go in. That quality is called the patavi. That quality is called patavi. Now, it has an extended nature. It has consumed a certain volume. Why is this? What is the reason for this? The most, most important part is the essence. That's why it's a substance. It's a thing. Even a photon has an essence. So now this thing we call, the, 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 the essence is called the Patavi. But that Patavi is not effective. It's, it's, it's incapable of doing anything, incapable of doing any of these functions unless it is extended. If it is not spread over all around, uh, over a certain amount of space, certain amount of volume of space, how could it hold something? How could it prevent something entering that space? So it has to be extended. It has to be spread over a, a certain amount of space. Extension means, now think about this as a certain, the, if you think this is a tiniest point of the space, there is no such a thing. But if you imagine, if this is the, 
this is the area of the Kalapa. The Patavi has to be extended in all these area. It means dispersing or spreading the Patavi. It has to be it has to be spreaded or it has to be sorry, it has to be spread. It has to be spread all over this area. So what is this? How does it happen? According to Theravadians, this spreading is due to something called a bloating nature. It's because of a bloating nature. It pushes away the butter. It spreads the butter all around the place to all the directions, three dimensionally. But then what happens? That force can burst this and scatter this hardness into the space. For that, there should be a force that works inside. It holds it. Which holds it. So that we call the opposite. So because of these two forces acting opposite upon each other, opposite to each other, upon the hardness. Hardness happens to be spread over a certain amount of space and it is confined to a certain area because it is held in that area. We are unable to explain how it works. We have to imagine that it is working to the internal spot or the internal center of the Kalapa. There is an imagination. But somehow it is kept there. That quality which holds the Patavi will not be able to explain it pinpointing because even scientifically you cannot explain what is mass other than saying the resistance for acceleration. So in the same way while we are explaining the four great elements through a Kalapa, the quality which holds the hardness in that area, the quality which spreads hardness in that area is the Vapo, Vayo. Apo is the quality which holds it. We will not be able to pinpoint it what it is. But the function is done. When we accelerate an e electron, the more you accelerate, the more force you have to put in. So it shows that there is some kind of a quality within it which resists the force, which resists the acceleration. How do you understand it? Because if you want to accelerate 20 meters per uh, second into two, how do you call it? I don't know, <laughs> into the normally acceleration is written like this, right? Right. So if you want to accelerate in, in 10 degrees, and if you accelerate in 20, you need to have more force. So it shows that there is some quality within the electron which prevents this acceleration, which is opposing this acceleration. You cannot show what it is. In the same way, the hardness which prevents the entering of another substance is kept in one area. That is due to another quality we call Apo. It is it's spread over a certain area. That is due to a quality called Vayu. So we see the outcome and we imagine the cause. That's what happens in the electron. We see an outcome. It's hard to accelerate, increase the acceleration. In the same way, so we know there is something called a mass. The part of it's not scattered in there. Why is that? Because it's kept there by a certain force. It is not shrunk into one focal point. It doesn't collapse because it is pushed away. That is because of Vayu. So now we come into the extended nature, consuming a volume. Why Patavi, why the Kalapa consumes a certain volume? Why the Kalapa consumes a certain volume? Because there is a certain quality which extends this at the same time, which makes it to have a certain shape without letting it to scatter. So these two qualities which gives it the shape 
a specific shape is called vayu and apo apo holds the patavi vayu pushes the patavi away then according to the theravadians now this is something that we have to greatly depend on the theravada doctrine according to the theravadians they say all these two forces apo and vayu for them to function properly there should be a certain quality which exists within them that is tejo and also it makes this hardness much stronger we are explaining the kalap rupas based on their function hardness is more stronger and much i would say durable not durable it's 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 more strengthened and it becomes more tang tangible or it's it's there it can exist due to a certain cause or certain energy in a quality i would call rather better to use the word quality that quality is also responsible for the two forces to act properly effectively so that's called tejo so there is another quality within it right which enables it. now think about the heat according to science how is how is it explained you cannot show what heat is heat is now we explain when there are two differences in the temperament temperature there is a transference of heat what transfers is called the heat you cannot show what heat is this is the definition even scientifically advanced scientifically so what i want to explain is these kind of definitions are possible even in theravada tradition we have so much such definitions when you go into nama most of the definitions a, a quite number of definitions are based on this approach how do we explain the bhava rupa the masculinity and femininity according to theravada tradition a quality which gives the appearance of a man or a female male or a female you cannot show what the bhava rupa is it's not explained it has not been explained you cannot show it like even you cannot show it like hardness there is a quality within the living beings which enables us to distinguish this is a male and this is a female the rupa has not been clearly explained it has been explained based on its function now think about the virya a good, better way to explain virya some it can be also explained as usahan lakana the best way to explain one of the best ways to explain virya is the force that enables the mind to keep on continuing on a specific task without giving it up there is such quality in the mind because the intention to do something is the chetana is the volition it's not the effort it can be felt as effort because of effort how do we know effort effort is known we do not give up our task so this is a kind of a way of explaining the things so you don't need to stuck only to see what the characteristic is you can make definite you can make certain approaches to understand the deep philosophical things so that's why i took the example of an electron even scientifically they have taken this method in the theravada tradition you see this method even in any philosophy you see such methodologies in how to make definitions how the explanations are given so when you understand to understand the rupa through a kalapa the best way to explain patavi is its resistance for another substance to enter into its space what is apo and vayu the quality which holds this apatavi into a certain uh, which the quality which spreads the patavi into a certain area and holds that patavi how do we know because it's not scattered it's somehow kept in a one place with a certain shape because we were able to distinguish the thing is the someone can argue is in this a reality is in the entire thing a reality as we call in science according to the theravada philosophy no according to the theravada philosophy there can be arguments on this but according to the theravada philosophy no the substance itself is not the kalapa substance substantial quality is just preventing something to enter into it 
it is not effective, it is not functioning properly unless it is extended. The reason that we can show it in two different ways also gives the idea that these are two qualities. The extended quality and the substantial quality. You cannot have a substance without extension. You cannot have extension only without a substance. That is true. I'll repeat again. You cannot have a substance without an extension. You cannot have an extended quality without a substance. If you have an extended quality without a substance, means it has it will go through. It will go through it. Something will go through there. Possible, possible to imagine, but I don't know whether there is such things exist in the real world. But these are two different qualities: the substantial quality and the extended quality. The substantial quality is given to it by Patavi. So it's not the Kalapa. Unless it is extended, it's not a Kalapa. The hardness itself is not a Kalapa. The extension itself is not a Kalapa because now think, if it is extended without a substance, the Kalapas may go through each other. If just the substance, the quality without extension, it doesn't have a shape, it cannot come into existence. I see personally two different qualities. So therefore, the substantial quality is not the Kalapa. The extended quality is not the Kalapa. So therefore, the Patavi, Apo, Tejo are alone, not the Kalapa themselves. So Kalapa is a combination of these qualities. The quality which enables the extension, the quality which makes the enables the extension, Apo and Vayu. The quality that which gives the substantial quality, the patavi, a quality that exists within that which makes them stronger, Tejo. So this is the explanation. Now I hope you got the idea. Now when you come from the Kalapa to the Rupa, from the Kalapa to the Rupa, now we think about a Kalapa, I'll summarize, I'll conclude the lecture. Kalapa has certain qualities like an electron it is a substance, it is extended, it has a color, smell, taste and nutriment. Just focus on the first two, we will get. It consumes a space and it defies the entering of another substance into its space. So the second quality of rejecting entering of another substance is given to it by Patavi, the hardness we call it. That quality is hard, the Patavi, that which prevents it something from entering into it. And it is extended due to another two qualities called Apu and Vayu. Then there is another extra quality which exists within them which makes them to function properly. And then to conclude, to conclude, it also has, according to Theravadians, it has a color, it has a taste, smell, smell, taste, and a nutriment. So all together, we call a part Rupa Kalapa. We call it a Rupa Kalapa. So the first four qualities I would call the major qualities and the, the remaining four are the minor qualities. Uh, yeah. So then we come into the following fundamental, we can arrive the, uh, the, with the following explanation, above explanation, we can allow at the following fundamentals. I will read out 1.44.1. The particle that cannot be physically reduced any further, physically reduced any further, into its components is called a Rupakala. But it is liable to intellectual analysis. You cannot analyze it intellectually. If something can be analyzed intellectually, it makes a sense. It doesn't need to be physically reduced. That is the philosophy. We have thought experiments, we call. A lot of thought experiments. Imagined ideas. If it, is, if, if, it, if it makes sense, we have to consider it something valuable, something, something uh, which makes sense, like it's, it, it's something that to be considered. But it is liable to intellectual analysis. Hence, Rupa Kalapa is not an ultimate reality. Material attributes such as hardness, cohesion, bloating nature cannot be reduced into their components even intellectually. Hence, are called Rupa. They are ultimate realities as they defy, they prevent the analysis. So this is how, now, in the previous two lectures, we explained the qualities of hardness, cohesion, and all these, and we explained how a Kalapa is made. Now, we came from a Kalapa. We investigated the attributes of Kalapa. 
and we name them who are responsible for these attributes. That's what we did, who are responsible. Substance, to conclude, the substantial quality, Patavi is responsible, extended quality. Apu and Vayu are uh, responsible. For them to function, Tejo is responsible. Color, smell, taste, and nutriment are different attributes. So combination of them are the Kalapa. So when you come with this approach, I hope you got the idea, the difference, if you, I hope you saw the subtle difference of these two approaches. Then that's the uh, essence, the ma main point that I want to convey through this lecture. It's not to explain Patavi Apu, uh, because we have already, be, according to the teacher, we have it. Uh, written uh, what, what their qualities are, uh, but to make that approach so we will be able to get closer to this idea. Yeah. So this all explains that even the tiniest kalapa is made out of certain qualities. So nothing to say about a human being or nothing to say about the entire body because the entire body when you reduce into kalapa is a bunch of kalapas, a group of kalapa. There is no one self or one person or one essence which you can call I or myself. Nothing to say, even a kalapa is a combination of eight qualities. So there's nothing to think about myself or I when we consider about the body. So it shows the utmost, it leads us to the utmost, utmost non-selfness. That there is no person here because the body is made out of kalapas, which is not one thing. A lot of kalapa, even a single kalapa. The body is not one thing, it's made out of many kalapa. Even a single kalapa is made out of some of these qualities. So there is no person to be investigated. Yeah, I conclude the lecture and I give the opportunity to ask the questions. So one day, no yeah. has no any questions. Okay, okay. <laughs> anyway. Yes. Uh, okay, so there is a question. What is the origin of Rupa? Range of Rupa? Uh, what is the uh, origin? Origin of Rupa. I'll be discussing them in the f uh, future lectures. There are four origins according to the Theravada tradition. One is because of karma. The karma we do. We, does, we do. Sorry. Then the consciousness itself is uh, one kind of origin. We call the Chittupada or the Chitta. The consciousness and the mental factors all together produce the uh, certain kind of matter. And uh, there is another matter produced by the nutriment which makes our body stronger. And there is another, the most abundant matter in the universe according to the Theravada is produced by this Tejo. This Tejo. So when a Kalapa is found, the this force that makes this to function properly, the Tejo, produces another new Kalapa. It's like a virtual reality according to science. They completely appear out of nothing. That's how uh, it is explained in the Theravada, out of nothing, but due to a cost. Cost is the reason. Uh, so there are four, four causes of origin. Karma, the consciousness, consciousness together with the mental factors. Uh, even you say consciousness is not a problem. Then the nutriment and the teju, heat or coldness. These are the four origins of the rupa. I shall explain them in detail. Okay, thank you. Uh, how about other friends? So, one of is very good, no? No question? Oh, okay. Uh, the family sister, maybe first. I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed and not prepared. I have to review and rethink. <laughs> Sorry? I am all with you. Yeah, he has to he has to review and rethink. Uh, it's too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Sorry for uh, that. So, so that. Maybe he or she has a, uh, she will have questions yeah. tomorrow, maybe. So it means uh, it is is it too much? <laughs> The, the the information maybe yeah because uh, I know that uh, I took a different approach because normally we don't take this approach in while we uh, study Abhidhamma uh, so this was made to now normally what we do is we study the four great elements and explain the Kalapa with that but uh, there are certain things that we will not be able to explain now when we go into the next lesson tomorrow's lesson 
it's going to be uh, not this much difficult, but uh, you will see that uh, why this approach is valuable when we try to explain the, uh, how the four grade elements work inter within the Kalapas and so forth. So yes, I know that uh, the information, the bulk was too much and also it was a very, uh, I would call it quite deep philosophical uh, concepts that I was discussing today. Uh, but please review them. And also, and also we, we started this after a gap of two weeks. So therefore the momentum has been dropped, I think. So please go through the previous lectures about the four great elements, the previous two lectures, and then uh, if you look into this, there it will be much clearer. Okay, thank you so much, Pandit. So next question is, what is the relationship between Rupa and Ajeta? Oh, Rupa and Chitta, the relationship. There's a very huge relationship within the Panchavokara realm. The huge relationship. In the Panchavokara realm, it means in the human realm, the Deva realms, the Brahma realms, the Chitta cannot exist without Rupa. Cannot exist without Rupa. And then in the living, living bodies like humans and animals, when the Chitta is not there, the body starts to get rotten. It starts to die. So Nama and Rupa are mutually related to each other, greatly related to each other. And also the thing, another thing is they appear to be the same thing. That is the strange phenomenon. It de deceives us, showing that this is a one person, this is a one thing. The Nama Rupa is, appears to be combined together and be like a one thing. So they are very closely related. So what we have to do in the Vipassana is we have to separate them. We have to observe the Rupa first and Nama, Rupa and Nama separately. Then we say, see them as two different elements. We call this Nama Rupa Paricheda, separating Nama from Rupa intellectually. And to keep on doing this again and again for many times. Then you understand this, there is nothing called a person, a sense here. Because when they are combined together, combined means with our mind, and they also manifest in that manner. That's the thing. They manifest in that manner as a, as a combination, as a one thing. So it gives us lots of, it, it opens the door for lots of ideologies. This person, combination of Nam and Rupa, this one person, one thing, instead of taking as two things, we take it as a one thing. This is created by God. This would travel from life to life. So, for example, as it is quite important for our vipassana, we think about Nama and Rupa. They are two different things. I draw it in another color, to another color. Nama and Rupa. <clears throat> but what happens? Instead of seeing them as one, instead of seeing them as two different things, we see them as a one separate unit. This is the problem. Now we are dealing with this, but actually in the reality, in the reality, there are two different things, sorry. But we work with this. So now what happens? Instead of taking them as two different things, we take it as a one thing, as a self, person, I, and we think, tend to think, this is created by God. This would travel from life to life. This is, this happens spontaneously and this would vanish after death. So all these various ideologies, I'm not sure whether they were clear, 
uh, yeah. For example, self, person, I, this would travel from life to life, or this would pass away at that moment of death, this arose out of nothing, this was created by a God. All these ideologies are possible because you take it as a one thing, one essence. So that's why Buddha mentioned, now this is the reality. This is the reality. The reality is, Nama is there. Then we have Rupa. Instead of taking them as a one thing, instead of taking them as two things, we consider them as one. Right? But actually, is the Rama and Rupa separately? They are interdependent. They have a great mutual interest on them. Mutually interdependent in various ways. But the thing is, they appear to be as one. They appear to be as one. That's their nature. That's how the world is made. That's how the world exists. That's why ignorance can happen. If it was very clear to us that the Nama and Rupa are separate things, none of us would have that self-view. So in, that's why in some places the Buddha would say the Nama Rupa is cheating you. The five aggregates are liars. They deceive you. We get into their trap. For that we have to be very mindful, very sharp, very intelligent to know, always to keep in mind, no, this is not one thing. These are the combination of two things. If the one thing, if we come into the idea of a one thing, if we come into the idea of a one thing, if we come into the idea of a one thing, what happens? We have few options. Either it was created by a God. No, we have the self idea. I person and all this, we either we think it has been created by God, it suddenly arose out of nothing, it would disappear at the death, or it would transmigrate from life to life. All these ideologies would come. So what we have to do is, we have to separate it. We have to see the underlying truth, truth beneath this. Truth beneath this self idea. And see the Nama and Rupa, but still it's the, not the function either. For that, the best way is you have to understand their mutual relationship. Still, the function is, the uh, uh, thing is not done. Later, we have to find out that Rupa is not a one thing. It's a generation of Rupas happening. Even Nama is not a one thing. It's a generation of Namas. Then, how it happens after death, how the generation continues after death, how a new rupa, new generation of rupa, quite different from here, would occur and continue. So these things, these, these ideas, we have, to we have to clarify. Then we understand it's a new thing, but connected to the previous. Nothing has moved. There is no one to move actually. Even someone thinks that Nam and Rupa are two things, but if you understand they completely vanishes at the moment of death, still it's wrong view. But normally if you understand the Nama Rupa and clearly, in most of the cases you will be able to understand the rebirth properly. So yes, so the question, I, I took the answer to a completely different arena because I thought it will be very useful 
uh, the, the short answer is yes, Nama and Rupa are depend, greatly dependent upon each other. Nama cannot exist without Rupa in the five Panchavokar in the Bhakma Deva realms. Rupa cannot exist, uh, Rupa cannot exist without Nama in the Panchavokar realm as well. If the Rupa, uh, the Nama dies, the Rupa would also get rotten. So I shall explain this combination. There is a special lecture for this, the combination, the relationship of Rupa and Nama and Rupa. For as meditators, what is important to you is mostly these Nama and Rupa are interdependent. So what happened? They have a very close relationship. They appear as one thing. They appear as one thing. Okay, thank you so much, Mandy. Uh, next question is, I think you mentioned about the discourse community. Could yeah. you please explain further? Yeah. A discourse community. A discourse community means a group of people who adhere to certain ideologies, certain concepts and they have a specific language to express their ideas. We all are in different discourse communities. For instance, if you are in a sports club, think about soccer. If you are in a soccer club, soccer club is a discourse community. They have specific usages. They have specific ways of explaining a shot how to tackle, how to pass the ball, and what are our all goals, achievements to win a league or to go into a national team. So within that discourse community, we have specific goals, specific ways of communication, specific terminologies, specific adherence. We have beliefs, we have role models. It's a one discourse community. The soccer discourse community may differ from a rugby discourse community because they have different values, different ways of thinking, different anticipation goals. A scientific discourse community, religious discourse community. Now think about the Buddhist Theravada discourse community. We have a specific goal that is Nirvana, but it's not the Nirvana. Now if you take the Mahayana discourse community, the Nirvana, the Mahayana is explained, the Theravada is explained, is quite different. If you think about the Sarvastivadians, they have a different discourse community. And within the Theravadians, we have role models, we have certain beliefs, we have certain ways of expression, we have a certain goal, we have a certain way of communication, we have certain ethics. Even in a football community, there are, there are ethics, right? Maybe the, the captain has to go into the field first. It may be something rude that someone else walks into the, team, into, the, into the ground before the captain, maybe. In the, in, the, in the Theravada discourse community, in the monks Theravada discourse community, you have to stand up when a senior comes. These are ethics. It is not valid. It may, be, it may not be valid in another community. In a sports club, you don't need to stand up when the captain comes. But in a Theravada community, you have to stand up. So when you think objectively, we are in various discourse communities in our lives. Monks, especially monks, the, uh, the discourse communities of monks are limited mostly. But if I am studying in a university, I have to adhere to the rules and regulations of the university. That's why in a university normally, the re respect comes from for the position, not for the seniority. But in the monk society, there are uh, there is a respect for the, uh, the qualifications in the monk society as well, but much is given for the seniority. But in university, the discourse community is different. The goals are different. So now when we come into a discourse community, the thing is we have a specific goal, we have a way of made, mode of communication, we have terminology, we have ethics, we have certain adherences. Then, we have something called discourse community facts. Facts, what are a fact is a fact. A fact means something that does not need to be proven, which is something considered as true. 
there are certain facts in the entire, for the entire world, except for few communities. Now, if you think the Earth as a globe, this is a fact to the entire world, except for the flat earthers. They would not accept this. There is a society called flat earthers. They would not accept the Earth is a globe. Or it's some, some religious people whose doctrine says the Earth is flat. And if you think about the brain is supporting the consciousness, it supports our conscious experiences. It's a fact because it has been proven that when certain parts of the brain are taken off, our certain abilities reduces. But it is not the consciousness, it supports the consciousness, what I'm saying. Heart is a vital organ for the human being, so it's a fact. You don't need to prove it anymore. It has been proven now. But there are within the discourse communities, there are certain things that we consider as fact. In the Christian discourse community, ultimate God, the almighty God, omnipresent, omnipotent God is a fact. You don't need to prove it. You believe it. But within a Buddhist discourse community, it's not a fact. It's something false. Rebirth is a fact within a Buddhist community. But if you go into a scientific community, it is not a fact. It is something that should be investigated. It is something that to be proven. Within a physics community, it's just an opinion. Because there is nothing called a consciousness according to them. It is only the fundamental particles. But they are not fully, fully confident on that. So likewise, within a, something that sh should not need to be proven within a discourse community, like a rebirth in the Buddhist community, like the Buddha was self fully enlightened, fully self enlightened. This is not something to be proven. It's considered as a fact. Whether it has a scientific basis or whether it is proven scientifically, whether it is proven empirically, that is not the reason. Within a community, if, if everyone or most of the majority accepts something as a truth, that is considered as a fact. So when you think about a discourse community, a group of people who communicate in certain manners, who have certain, who adhere to certain ideology, who have certain goals, who has certain ways of communication, who works towards that goal, is a discourse community. And the things that are, that are already, that doesn't need to be proven, whether they are proven or not, this is something else, that doesn't need to be proven, which are considered as truth from the first, from the first place, uh, which are considered as truth, are considered as facts in that. So when we say the Rupa Kalapa has eight qualities, it is a fact within the Theravada discourse community. But if you take this into the scientific community, they will say no, Kala is a secondary quality, not a derived, but I'm not, not I'm talking about derived matter. Kala is a quality within the light. Smell is a chemical, uh, uh, smell is a, uh, stimuli or, or a feeling that you get through a chemical reaction. Taste the same. So they would say the color, taste, smell cannot exist in the color according to the scientific method. But according to, the, according to the Theravada tradition, we taken it as, we have taken it to granted or we have taken it as a fact that the Kalapa has all these qualities. So when we are studying now this, when we have such a clear clarity in our minds, we don't come into conflicts because we are not explaining a scientific, we are not a scientific discourse community fact here. We are a Theravada discourse community fact. So I'm explaining it based on Theravada discourse community. Even what I say doesn't match scientifically. I'm not afraid to say that because I'm talking to a theory discourse community of the Theravadians. But if I give the same lecture to a different discourse community, I have to be very careful. I have to mind my language. I have to mind my ways. I have to mind my way of expression. Because they are not going to accept them as facts, even though the people in the Theravada discourse community accepted them. So it's a very good question, and thank you for that. So we have to have a very good clarity about the discourse communities, especially when we are going to preach the Dhamma to the outside world, to the, to the world.
Okay, thank you, Pandi. Uh, so next question is, Pandi, you said without the Nama, who are we broken? May I ask why those who born in the Asana Sata, their body cannot be broken? What I mentioned was about the humans and the animals. I, I gave an adjective word, adjectival word. I was very careful about that. I said, in the human and the animal realm, when the consciousness is not present, the body gets rotten. Not for the devas, not for the brahmas, not for the asanga sattas. So, I, uh, we have to say it like that. I, I actually mentioned for the devas and the humans and the animals, because devas' body is the brahmas' body. Is Especially the asana sattas, as you said, it doesn't get rotten. Uh, yeah, rottening doesn't happen in the deva realm. So it disappears, the body disappears. Then one can ask why the body doesn't disappear. That is a special case. These are special cases, like uh, one, one simile. It's not proving, it's, it's, uh, it's one simile given by a very specific teacher, very erudite teacher is that. Normally the clay, when you put into water, it gets dissolved. Clay gets dissolved. But that the same clay, if you make it into, uh, if you make it into, if you burn it, if you make it into a, a pot, so the chemicals would be different. But anyway, if you make it into a pot, that same clay will be put, will will be able to sustain in the water without getting dissolved. Why is that? The clay was made into different form by burning. In the same way, an ordinary karma would give a birth. I would explain this fact. I would explain this fact in the Rupa, Rupa chapter, clearly in one, one lecture. The ordinary karma gives a rebirth in which a life in which Nama and Rupa both have to sustain mutually. But when the karma was developed into a higher stage, like the chitta, uh, the fifth jhana and chitta viraga bhavana, the karma comes into, it's a different karma. So that karma gives a life which you can sustain without the consciousness. The, in the same way, uh, some karmas develop into very higher concentration can give a life which can sustain without the rupa. So these are specific, specific special cases. Like for example, hydrogen or oxygen, O2, Two molecules combined together is very useful for humans. But when it comes to O3, the ozone, the three molecules combined together, it is harm, harmful. If you, if you inhale it abundantly, it could cause problems to your system. So the same thing, when the structure is different, the number of L molecules are different, react differently, the same way. The karma, the ordinary karma of giving a dana, practicing sila, would give a life that is uh, that has to have both nama and rupa. But a karma that is developed to a very higher level and practiced with the chitta viraga bhavana would give a different sort of a life. A, a, a karma that is developed into the arupa consciousness level, arupa jhana, could give a different life which can sustain without rupa. And this, the nature of karma is greatly depending on the nature of the anusaya at that time. I shall clearly explain how the nature of kamma differs due to the nature of anusaya and how the rebirth differs based on that. I shall explain that later. Just to give the idea because the, that life is given by a different karma. Okay, thank you. So next question is, can we say Jaita is a special kind of muba? Uh, it's uh, no. It's the direct answer is no. According to the Theravadians, no. It's something arupa. But someone can ask this question. So I, I'll let you know. I, I'll explain it this way. Chitta is arupa. In what sense? It's not a material thing. It's not a physical thing. But is it completely out of all physical attributes? Well, someone can ask the question. I would say no. It's a, it may be controversial, but I would say no. Chitta do associate certain physical attributes. What is that? What are the physical attributes that Chitta doesn't have? It is never extended. 
it's not a substance it's never extended it's not a substance it's not a 3d thing so how do we explain in theravada tradition when the four great elements come together they appear as a thing i call rupa kalapa but even the entire number of all the tittas come together of the all human beings of all the living beings they would not form even the tiniest rupa kalapa they would not form such a thing because they don't have that quality of creating an extended thing hence they are rupa they are not rupa but is chitta can chitta be located in terms of space physicality is greatly depending on space physical stuff is extended are extended and they consume space they consume space is chitta related to space the answer is yes why is that because when we say now this is the i for example if rupa kalapas kamma ja kalapas here right shall i draw it much bigger if this is rupa kalapas chakku dasa kalapas the eye base i i i sensitivity according to the tradition we say chitta appears in one kalapa if this is the place chitta appears chitta appears in this kalapa not in these kalapas okay let me let me not draw it like that if chitta appears in this kalapa not in these kalapas what does this mean this kalapa for example has a location it's located in the space if we can say according to the tradition if the tradition says the chitta appears here not in this kalapa only in here it shows that chitta has to be located within that space or maybe upon it maybe in it whatever I'm not able to say that it shows that the location of chitta at least even we are unable to say at least it is confined to this area we if we say the chitta associates rupa it means it's associating a certain space is related to a certain space spatial attribute is a material attribute substantial spatial temporal temporal is related to time uh, matter manama and rupa both the time the, the the duration of existence duration of existence i would call temporal spatial substantial these are material attributes is chitta spatial spatial means not special spatial means special yeah special yes why is that because we are able to we are we say boldly that chitta exists on chitta appeared on this color but not in this color it shows that chitta was not existing here not here not here it has to exist in this on this color but so to a certain extent at least we can say it has to be there and we also say according to the theravada tradition the swirl cycle the levels of the uh, levels of the uh, divine worlds now this is the five suddhavasa if this is akanitta the last brahma suddhavasa realm arupa realm is located after few kilometers lot of kilometers above from akanitta so the arupa realm exists this is the neva sanyana akinchanya akasananchaya sorry uh, i'm making lot of mistakes today <laughs> drawing now this is the akanitta this is akasananchaya vinyananchaya so i once were born here has to exist within this space and the next thing is the most interesting is interesting fact is 
Now, if you take this as a kalapa, at least we can say if the chitta exists here, it is associating a space around here. You can just show something. This is the space. Because it's associated in the rupa. Maybe it's a pony or whatever. Maybe it's associated. You cannot show it. But its location can be shown. Because we say it is not associated in another kalapa. Now think about the arupa realm. In the arupa realm, chitta is not associating a rupa. So where does it exist? It's a huge problem to explain. If chitta is not spatial, if chitta is not, cannot be explained spatial, it has to be existing everywhere. This is not a logic. If Buddha is observing, or a person with psychic power is observing the mind of arupa being, which location is observing? A hypothesis or suggestion that can be made is, you think about the tiniest amount, the, the space of a kalapa, of a hadevatu. Think about the hadevatu, because in those realms, chakku vinyana and those doesn't, doesn't appear. Now this is, if this is the, uh, this is the uh, size of a hadevatu, ordinary hadevatu, right? We can assume chitta has to appear in a space we can bring an idea. Chitta has to appear. Sorry, how do, I, how do I draw it? Anyway, if you now we have to say chitta has to appear in a space equal to that of a Hadevatu Rupa, Hadevatu Dasaka, Kalapa. Like the constant, the tiniest part. Otherwise, if you say it doesn't have a spatial attributes, the question comes where it exists. Because these two suggestions, which says that it has to exist within this range, not above, not below. And more specifically, if you're telling it associates a certain base, Chitta has to associate that specific Kalapa. So, according to the tradition, chitta is not material, in which sense, obviously, it will never get extended. It will never get extended. It is, uh, how much uh, chittas or chetsikas come together, it will never be extended. But in terms of the space, it has to have a location. Yeah, that would be my answer. Okay, thank you so much. And then actually now it's already over time. Yes, but yeah. Because today is the first day of New Year, so one friend says yes. Uh, and then please give some advice shortly for our way for to continue this New Year successfully. Okay. So what I personally believe is uh, uh, Buddha has mentioned, Buddha has already encouraged us to keep some goals, targets, not to get frustrated on them, not to get... Uh, pressurized on our own targets, but uh, always we have to make review about ourselves. So after the Devadatta was uh, uh, destined to be born in the hell after making the schism in the Sangha, Buddha mentioned uh, that uh, each and every monk, this is even uh, how to apply applicable to lay people, lay devotees, that you have to time to time you have to review yourself. How was your growth? How was your decline? Kale na kalang atta sampatti paccha vikita hoti. Kale na kalang atta vipatti paccha vikita hoti. Whether my meditation has grown, whether my concentration has grown up, whether my wisdom has grown up, whether my Dhamma knowledge has grown up in the previous year. How was I in the previous 2021 January 1st and 2022 January 1st? What was the difference? Have I increased or declined my qualities? We may see some qualities have increased, some qualities may have declined. And also to, then we should not, we have to be very happy about our, about our developments and try to maintain it. If we see a decline, obviously, no need to regret regret. Obviously, there will be some regret, but that we have to turn into the positive side and determine, no, I will overcome this and I'll try to move ahead from this position. And also, Kale in a Kalan, 
Parasampatti pachavikita hoti, paravipatti pachavikita. Also, we had to observe the development and decrease of others. Not, in, not to have jealousy or to discriminate or to look down upon others, to, but to take an example. If that person, now we see uh, some monk or a nun or a lay person has increased in her or his meditation, if she or shy, he can, why, why can't I? I should also try, put my effort, like what Sumedha, the tapasa, the ascetic, having seen the Deepankara Buddha, instead of admiring him, he thought, yes, he's a human being, he's a man, why I'm also a man and a human being, why can't I be? Why can't I come to that position? And he made the endeavors for that. So likewise, seeing someone's growth, we have to be happy for them, about them, and we, have, we try to, not to imitate, but to follow, take them as a role model. And seeing the downfall of others, like what happened to Devadatta, or what happened to Ajatasattu because of the wrong companionship, we may also determine ourselves that I would not come into that level because that state is doomed to go into the wrong side. So I would ab uh, ab abstain from those causes that would trigger our downfall. So likewise, so it's a good time, opportunity for to reflect upon the past, past year and to make determinations. And when you come into the next new year, 2023 new year, make some plans. I would, I would increase my Dhamma knowledge. I would have read this amount of, amount of sutras by that time. I, have, I would be, have uh, listened to this much of Dhamma, Dhamma, Dhamma talks. I would have done this much of courses in Dhamma. This much of hours of meditation every day, half an hour or one hour. So if you multiply it by 365, 365 hours per the year, it's a, it's a huge amount of meditation when you consider it. So, and also always keep some marks or keep a track about what you have done. So, when the next year, when the next year comes, I'm not encouraging to about this. If you have done it for the previous year, now it's time for you to enjoy and look back into your uh, success and to have some uh, innocent uh, happiness or dignity about yourself and try to increase it. If you are starting from this year, please make a note or please make a determination or plan that what, where you will be by 2023, January. But don't take it as a uh, thing that pressurizes you. Some goals you may not be able to achieve. Even if, even if you make five goals, five, five uh, determinations, but at least if you can fulfill one, that's a huge achievement. At least if you can fulfill it for six months, you can revive that within six months. Or maybe after three months, you can revive our, how, how much I have made the, made, the, made the goal. That's what you do in, professional, in professions. When, you want, when we have a, have a certain task, we divide into a few months and we, we recheck our progress. So when we come to the 2023 January, so you will surely, if you, if you follow this, you'll be able to. At that time, when you recall about the 2022 year, you'll surely be able to be happy about yourselves. So I wish you all the best, all the success for the new year. May you be able to proceed well in all your sublime and wholesome, may mundane or secular or spiritual aspirations. And may you be able to achieve your goals within this year itself. Thank you very much. Sadhu, 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 Mande. So, Mande, on behalf of all the friends in our group, we wish all the uh, Mandes in IIT be healthy and the uh, separate Buddha star more successfully. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Uh, Thank you very much. Buddha sasanang chirantit tattu. Buddha sasanang chirantit tattu. Buddha sasanang chirantit tattu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.